like the first two days I've had people like this in the morning and then towards the end it was like half the stage and then even more like it just builds up with time. Yeah? Like after several always been up like I don't know why. <laughs> it's a weird habit of turning up late. Introduce you now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let me introduce to you Liz Rice from Tank Top TV talking about the uh, To Infinity and Beyond, the story behind the Infinite Scroll. Please give her a warm welcome, everyone. Hi. Right. Okay, so, um, mm, weirdly, the screen isn't doing what I expected to do, but I'm using the wrong button, that's why. What have I done? We'll be there any second now. How do you make it? Little technical difficulty. There we go. There we go. Right. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So we'll start again. My name's Liz Rice. I am co founder of a startup called Tanktop TV. Um, I thought today I'd talk to you a little bit about an infinite scroll mosaic piece of code that we wrote and some of the lessons that we learned along the way. And our startup is all about TV and film, so I kind of couldn't resist calling it to infinity and beyond. Um, we're actually one of the wireless startups, so we've got a little booth over there. And you know, later on today, if you want to come by and say hi to any of the startups over there, we'd love to talk to you. We might look like we're working, but we're actually looking for an excuse to talk to nice people like you. So uh, do come and have a chat. So why do I want to tell you about our infinite scroll? Well, for some of you, an, an infinite scroll in itself might be a terrible idea. And we learned some of the things about when they're a good idea and when they're not a good idea that we thought we might share. And a few other user experience lessons that we learned along the way. Um, there's only three of us in our startup and only two of us who write code. So we have to do things on quite a kind of pragmatic basis. We can't, you know, we don't have tons of resources. We have to make some pretty fast decisions. Uh, so there's a few things that we learnt along the way, and also because there's only two of us, there's a whole load of stuff we don't know, and we learnt quite a few things, particularly about performance uh, through writing this this particular bit of code. Also, the infinite scroll code itself is open source, so there's a few things that you know maybe I can tell you about today in case you decide you want to use it, um, and you know we would love it if you did. So let me tell you a little bit about why we have this infinite scroll in the first place. Tanktop TV is all about making it really easy to find TV and films that you want to watch from all the different sources that on-demand uh, services offer us. In this country, there's over 20 different services like these that offer literally thousands of TV programs and films that are available to you. And, uh, you know, I like relaxing in front of a film. I like watching TV. There's all this content out there. But we actually thought it's kind of frustrating that you have to go and look at all these different services. It's like, you know, let's build something that makes it much easier and fun to explore all the different programs and, and films that are out there. So we thought, you know, we can build something better. And uh, we worked with our designer, Emma. And this is a kind of really early mock-up that she put together for this concept of exploring different TV programs. And there was a few things about this that we absolutely loved straight from the get-go. The first thing is how the images for the different programs are different sizes. 
we felt that really makes it not feel too structured, too formal, you know, it makes it feel much more like something you can explore. And it's really obvious that you could go in either direction and you'd find more programs. It, it sort of lends itself to, to exploring. So that was really sort of the birth of this idea that we'd have essentially an infinite scroll of programs and that we'd have this mosaic effect of different sizes. So at around the time we were looking at this, there was quite a lot of um, discussion on sort of Hacker News, that kind of site, about, well, are infinite scrolls actually a good idea? And Etsy quite famously implemented one and then discovered that they were just losing conversions. It was, uh, you know, just didn't work for them. And really what it comes down to is for an e-commerce site, you want people to make a decision. And if you offer them too much choice, it makes it hard for them to make a decision. For us, the more time people spend on our site exploring TV programs, just checking out what's there, rating things, telling us what they think, the better, the more time, the more attention they're spending on our site, that's, that's good for us. We don't actually need people to be making a decision for it to be good for our business. So it's quite different from a typical e-commerce platform in that sense. Um, and obviously, eventually, we hope you do find something that you want to watch and then you make a decision to, to go ahead and, and do that. But it's not absolutely critical to us that you come to that decision quickly. So for us, Infinite Scroll is great. If you're building a shop, some kind of e-commerce platform, I wouldn't recommend it. So the mosaic pattern itself, uh, this is the original version we had. The idea is that there's a repeating pattern, so essentially the length of that whole screen repeats itself as many times as you like, but the viewport only shows you a fraction of what's available. And you can just repeat that pattern over and over and over again. And at this point, we're thinking, this is brilliant. Let's code it and try it out and put it in front of some people. And we really quickly hit our first problem with this infinite scroll. And the problem is that if you're on a touch device, the same gesture that you'd use to navigate backwards and forwards through that scroll also acts as the back button or the forward button on your browser. So essentially, you'd scroll, you'd get to the beginning of the scroll, if you like, and the next thing that happens is your browser goes back to whatever page it was on before. Potentially a completely different site. He just horrendous user experience, disaster, really annoying. I thought we you know, clearly cannot do this. In a parallel universe, I'm standing here telling you a really clever way that we came up with to avoid doing this back button uh, behavior on that gesture. What we actually did in a pragmatic decision was we turned the scroll on its side. We decided you can go up and down. There's no kind of vertical equivalent to the browser backwards and forwards. So let's do that. And actually, it turned out to be quite a good uh, sort of user experience decision for another reason, which is that we could essentially say the good stuff is going to be at the top of the list. You start at the top and you'll work your way down and we're going to try and put the best stuff near the top. And um, that, that kind of really seemed to make a lot of sense and we had neatly sidestepped that problem of the, uh, the browser back button. Now around the same time as we were uh, kind of making this kind of decision, we also we noticed that um, people, we had a a different, ugly, horrible TV site prototype that a few people were using. And a lot of people were using it specifically to look for films rather than TV programs in general. And we thought, well, we're a startup. We need to find a business model. Films are typically premium content. They're paid for. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes they're subscription. Sometimes they're, you know, you pay for them as you go along. But essentially, for a business model, maybe film will give us some, some better ideas for making some money. So we thought, we'll, we'll concentrate on movies for now. And that gave us something really nice to work with in terms of the images we were going to use. Somebody goes to a lot of trouble to design a film poster for every single movie. That poster conveys 
pretty much all the information that you need to sort of know, is this a film I'm going to find enjoyable? It quite often is going to tell you who's in the film. It, it's going to have artwork that tells you something about the style of the movie. So there's no better image to use than the film poster. But we need to show the whole, whole film poster. We can't truncate it. If we crop the top or the bottom, we might be missing all sorts of really important information. So we needed to come up with a mosaic pattern where the aspect ratio was the same for every single block in that, in that pattern. So we got out some graph paper, we got out some pencils, we just played around a bit with trying to find a design that didn't look too rigid. Again, we wanted that sense of it feeling almost random, something you can explore, but that repeated nicely so that we could code it in pages. And uh, we came up with something, and it looks pretty much like this. Um, another sort of visual element that you'll notice is that all the corners get cropped off. That's really part of our visual identity. And we'll come to sort of how we did that momentarily. So uh, basically, as you scroll down the, the page, more and more films will get loaded up. Uh, and you, uh, it probably doesn't really show up very well, but you can kind of see that the scroll bar is getting shorter and shorter on the right-hand side because we've got more and more content on the page. That's all pretty straightforward stuff. You know, Ajax, we go and get some movie data a page at a time, telling us you know, what we need to render for each of those movie blocks. We use uh, something called JS Render to actually uh, generate each of those movie blocks itself with a, a, a nice template for each of those movies. And we handle scroll events to tell us when we need to load the next page. Pretty sensible stuff so far. Our first performance lesson was really about using CSS wherever possible rather than JavaScript for design and layout things. That's kind of pretty obvious, but um, you know, there were some things that we, uh, you know, we didn't necessarily know how we could do in CSS. Um, how many of you know about how you can use CSS borders to do triangles? Yeah, a couple, a few people do know. I'll just go through it quickly because when we started doing this, I didn't know this at all, and I just think this is so clever that basically, if you have uh, a border around an element, it's uses sort of diagonal shapes in each corner. So if you have, like in this example, a zero height element, you get triangles or trapeziums for those borders, if they're sort of thick borders. If you have a zero height top border, OK, now we've got something that looks a little bit like the kind of crop effect that we want at the top of each movie. So for each list item element that we have representing a movie. We've got uh, pseudo elements before and after. We've just illustrated the before here. And I'm using colors rather than transparent just to illustrate the effect. But essentially, we're cropping the left cor corner with a, a left border, the right corner with a right border. And we have a transparent border at the bottom so that the movie image can kind of shine through. One little hang up is that uh, you can't use before and after pseudo elements on what's called replaced elements, images and input. Um, and so we've got all these images, but OK, how are we going to crop the corners with these, this really neat little trick? Well, the, the simple thing we did was we have a list item. Inside that, there's a div. The d image is inside the div. The image inherits its size from the div, which inherits it from the list item. And it's the list item that's got that uh, pseudo element to do the corner cropping. And we just had to relatively position the div so that the image actually appears where we want it to, sort of not at the top of the list item, where the list item would naturally appear, but high enough up that the before element actually crops the, the corners off the image. Before we realized we could do this with CSS, we did try doing it with sort of positioning little images over the corners. Horrendously, horrendously slow. This was really nice. So 
Another thing that we do in CSS is we sort of animate these transitions. If somebody's not interested in a movie, they can basically say, you know, get rid of it, and we want all the other movies to shuffle around. And that was really nice and simple to do with animations. All we need to do is sort of fix up the position for the movies that need to shuffle around, and that just kind of works. But we couldn't do it absolutely entirely in CSS because uh, even though we can use nth of type to set the width and height for each block inside that mosaic pattern, the width and height are the same every n blocks, but the position isn't. As I put this presentation together, I realized we could actually be doing left with nth of type, but the top, the height, depends on which page that blocks in, not just on its own n, if you like. So we fix up the top and left with uh, JavaScript handlers that get called from that JS render uh, code that I mentioned earlier. So you're rendering a template, and it calls out to say, OK, where is the top, where is the left? And we just force the list item to have that top and left. OK. Something slightly awry with that picture, but it's basically supposed to show how we have different mosaic layouts for different device types and different screen sizes. So uh, on a mobile phone, we can show far fewer movies, but we still want to give that effect that you know it's not a rigid and very, very structured list. And we've got, I think it's five different layouts like this. And within each layout, we've got lots of different image sizes. But you really do not want, I mean, even I knew before we set about doing this that you don't want your browser to be resizing images for performance reasons, particularly if you've got potentially hundreds of them being managed by the browser at a time. OK, so we've got this problem now where we have 13,000 movies that we know about, each of them with an image. We might have to render those images in any of, I don't know, 25 different sizes, something like that. But we didn't particularly want to go around and resize them all up front, because maybe 10,000 of those images we're never actually going to show, because you know people aren't necessarily going to look at all of those different movies. And they're certainly pretty unlikely to see all of those different images in all the possible image sizes, on all the different possible device sizes. We need to be able to handle it, but we didn't want to have to calculate it up front. It's also pretty obvious that you don't want the server side to have to worry about where the image is being rendered. You know, you want that nice clean split so that the browser side is worrying about how it's presenting things and the server is just saying, here's the data I need you to present. Present it in a beautiful manner. So what we did is a image caching, essentially. Um, we store all our images on S3, and S3 lets you set up these redirect rules. So if the browser asks for an image that doesn't exist on S3, S3 can then redirect to our server and say, please, just resize this image for me. And it knows what image is, resized, uh, is required because it's embedded in the name of the URL for that image. So in a little bit more detail, the browser asks for some movie data, which comes back in JSON. In this example, we've got two films, A and B. And there's a sort of root image name for A and a root image name for B in that JSON. And the browser figures out, OK, movie A is going over here, and we need an image that is x by y. Requests image with a URL that's essentially a x y. S3 has that image, fabulous, returns it. For movie B, it's a different size. We'll call it XX and YY. S3 doesn't have that particular image, so it hits that 404 redirect rule. Gets, the request gets sent over to the server. The server figures out from the URL, aha, this is, I need this particular image in this particular size. Here you go, S3. And then that image is now cached and will forevermore be available should anybody want that movie in that particular size. 
Okay, the next uh, user experience problem that we tackled was really around paging. So if you go off to a different page, like here we're going to look at a movie detail page, then when you go back, you don't want to go all the way back to the top of that scroll again. That is super annoying. So you need to come back to pretty much roughly where you were in the scroll. It's not really terribly hard to implement. Uh, we basically have a page parameter that we update every time we load a new page of data, and we just push that into the browser history. Super easy, you just replace the, the current page in the browser, and then whenever you hit back, it's going to go to that correct page. We obviously also then needed to handle, OK, show me a film list, but start at page four, let's say. So you just have to make sure that we l allow for the space that the previous three pages would have required when we render that fourth page so you can scroll up as well as down. So the next thing, this is sort of more recent stuff that we've been working on. We, I mean, it kind of is obvious that if you ask your browser to handle more and more and more DOM, that is going to, you're asking more of it, and that's going to affect performance. I don't think it was quite so obvious to me, at least, how much difference it made putting that data into the DOM versus just holding that data in JavaScript. It actually made a huge difference. There are a few things that we'll look at now where um, we've got the data in our hand in the browser. If we render them in the DOM, it actually makes things quite slow. Rendering them on the fly was more effective. So there's a couple of examples. The first is, as you scroll down the list, there's a whole load of movies that we've previously rendered that have sort of disappeared off the top that actually you no longer need. And what we found was that you know, maybe the first 10 pages were performing really nicely, but as you scrolled further and further and further, things started to get sort of stickier and slower and jerkier and just not as nice. So pretty obvious thing to do is, oh, I've hit the wrong button again. There we go. A uh, pretty obvious thing to do is just to sort of discard some of those movies that are uh, not actually in the visible area. Kind of makes sense to allow a little bit of leeway so that you're not getting rid of things as soon as it's gone off the, the page so that you can sort of scroll up and down a little bit in either direction and the, and the DOM's all sort of ready there waiting for you. Um, we keep the data in the JavaScript side, so we don't have to go and request it again from the server, but it was significantly better sort of performance, better behavior in the browser to just get rid of the DOM rendered elements. So we still leave space for that, those movies. There's like a container element, but there's a massive space where those movies used to be. We also found this varies quite a bit from device to device. And again, this is pretty intuitive. If you have a big screen and you're showing 30 movies on that screen, then sort of each page worth of data is a lot more information to render, a lot more for the browser to cope with. On a phone, you know, you're only showing, let's say, three or four movies. There's much less to cope with per page. So figuring out the right balance between sort of how much data you keep in the DOM versus how much you, uh, obviously, if you throw it away, it's not there when you scroll back. Um, so we just have a different balance on different devices. The other thing that was hugely uh, a surprise to us was, well, makes a lot of sense that if you recalculate layout in a browser, that's going to take some time. That wasn't a surprise. But it was a surprise to us that every time you hit uh, some kind of offset height or offset width calculation, that performs a whole new re-layout calculation. So one of the mistakes that we'd sort of fallen into was if we're going to render a new page, we were saying, OK, let's find the bottom of what we've currently rendered and place this after it we were taking the offset height of the last page plus the height of that data, 
and that offset height was causing the whole layout to be recalculated. And we could do exactly the same thing by just saying, okay, how many pages have we got and what's the height of them? Gives us the exact same answer. Huge performance uplift by just doing that. I've slightly simplified that because um, you know how before I showed how you can sort of get rid of a movie if you're not interested in it and they all sort of shuffle up. So actually when we load a new page, it doesn't necessarily start at the boundary of a new page. We might have to go back and fill in some gaps that the previous page uh, had sort of left in it. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. We sort of say, well, what page are we on? What index within that page are we on? Okay. Okay, so we have this uh, movie information that you can see. You've got the poster. You can hover over it and you get a little bit of information. And then if you click on it, it sort of pops up to this modal with more information in it. So this is the hover, it's like a subset of where the film's available. We've got some sort of social proof uh, images, that kind of thing. And we had that in a div. And we used the same div and changed some CSS, essentially, to turn that same div into this modal pop-up. It's really nice and quick to use. You know, you just hover over a movie. You can really quickly see some, some information. You don't have to wait for a new page to be uh, loaded if you want to get a bit more information about the film. So we really like the, the behavior of that, sort of loading quite a lot of data about the film so that it's in your hand, uh, you know, if the user wants to find out more. And, yeah, the first way we did that was not very efficient in the DOM. And again, this comes down to this lesson we were learning about don't put stuff in the DOM if you can avoid it. Just keep the data in JavaScript if you can. So uh, the original version, we had this, this one div. It contained all this information about the film, the actors, the category of the film. And if we chose not to display that information in the, that roll-up overlay, we just hid the element and then unhid it when we showed the modal. What we've uh, recently changed it to do is we still have that uh, roll-up overlay div with the, that smaller set of information, but we build the modal pop-up dynamically. So all that extra information that we've got about the synopsis of the film and, and some of the other availability information and, and all kinds of other things. Rather than hold that in the div all the time, we just get that from the JavaScript and render it when we need it in that modal. And again, that made a surprisingly larger sort of difference um, to the performance, particularly as you sort of scroll through several pages. Um, we used Twitter Bootstrap originally for a lot of the, the styling that we use. And I think one of the, the things that we'd like to improve is when we go to that modal pop-up, on phones in particular, that's a little bit slow and sluggish and, and not as, as crisp as we really want it to be. Um, and I believe that Bootstrap 3 has improved the performance of those modal pop-ups quite a lot. So um, that's one of the things that we're going to look at to make it even crisper than it already is. Okay, um, just in case you decide that you do uh, want to use our infinite scroll, I thought I'd explain another thing that we're, we're doing that's kind of, I think, not well documented. You remember I, uh, how we have all those different sizes of uh, images? And some of them are really quite a lot smaller than the biggest ones. There's, I think it was four and a half times uh, the biggest ones are four and a half times bigger than the smallest ones. And for our purposes, those smallest ones really don't have enough room to kind of show a lot of information. That roll-up overlay, we couldn't really fit very much information in it. And it essentially wasn't good enough to, to describe a movie, not big enough to describe a movie. But we thought, you know, we still like this layout. 
maybe we can use these blocks for something else. So we've got all these sort of simpler things that we can include in those small blocks. Um, so for example, sometimes we use them to just link to a mo uh, an actor. So in this example, all Clint Eastwood movies. Um, sometimes we put uh, links or sort of messages, you know, invite your friends that might just appear in one of those small blocks. So we basically use them for different things that can kind of be interspersed in that exploring interface. And OK, that's great. But if we shuffle them about, we don't want these small blocks shuffling about. The, s the small blocks have to stay where they are because you can't shuffle them and put a movie in its place because it's just too small for the movie. So the way we've um, implemented this, we actually have two different lists of blocks, essentially. Um, we have the moving blocks, which are for the movies, um, and fixed blocks. And those two sets of blocks get rendered inside two different container elements, but we just make sure those container elements are on top of each other. And uh, we use different JSON feeds for each of those two different things. So you know, you're going to get movie JSON, you're going to go and get fixed block JSON. Or if you used it for something, you know, whatever your purpose, you could use them to inter interleave different items. Or you could say, actually, I don't want to have fixed blocks at all. I'll just have the moving blocks and make the, the fixed block sort of non, non-existent. OK. Um, there was one other little um, kind of story that happened to us. Um, quite early on in this whole process. And I, d I just thought I'd talk about this because it kind of killed us for about two hours trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And I thought it was quite a good example of how performance things can come at you from the most unexpected sources. So sort of version 0.0001 of what we put in front of users. We had this very sort of basic implementation of the infinite scroll with the mosaic. We hadn't done basically any of the performance uh, improvements that I've talked about today. And uh, OK, what order do we put the movies in? So I think I said before about how the idea is to put good stuff at the top of the list. How do we determine what's good? OK, we go to Rotten Tomatoes, and we get basically their user and critic ratings, and we put the most highly rated films at the top of the list. This makes sense. But it, pretty much as soon as we put it in front of any users, we realized that, uh, or they were saying, yeah, these are great. These are really good movies. But um, some of these are quite old, classic movies. You know, Casablanca, Citizen Kane. They're really, really great movies. They get really good ratings. So they were always appearing at the top of the list. But actually, what people want to see, you know, they want to see something that's been out. You know, they missed it at the cinema a couple of months ago. That you know, much more interested in recent films, typically. So, OK, that makes sense. Why don't we factor in the release date of the film, basically put good recent films at the top? We, we give each movie a score that's based on now. There's some other factors as well. But at the time, it was purely the critic and user ratings and the recency of that film. And uh, so we've, we've factored in the recency and somehow performance just absolutely drops through the floor. And we're, uh, we're looking at this going, have you changed something about like the rendering code? No, I haven't done anything. Because all I've done is I've changed the order that movies are coming from the server. Well, I don't understand what the problem is. It must be something with your machine. No, seriously, look at my look at, look at the performance of this. It's awful. And it really was. It just kind of, it, it was so jerky and awful. Well, mine looks fine, you know. My, my code looks absolutely fine on my machine. Well, have you got the latest server code? Don't really see how that can affect it. Well, turned out it did affect it. It made a big difference to us because, now remember, we haven't done any of the performance improvements at this stage, so we've not done any of that image caching. And what we found is that the newer movie images were massively higher resolution than the older ones. That, that's a logarithmic scale, right? They're orders of magnitude 
bigger typically. So suddenly we were getting the, the browser to try and resize these you know, gazillion megabyte images and to no wonder it slowed us down. But I thought that was kind of funny because that really did have us scratching our heads for probably a couple of hours trying to figure out what on earth could be different between these two different uh, sort of sets of data, if you like. It was so exciting we had to, uh, you know, draw a plot. So that's basically what our infinite scroll code does at the moment. There's probably a whole load of things that, um, you know, we could do to make it even faster and even better. But if you want to use it, it's there on GitHub, along with a few other bits of Django project that we've uh, contributed to. Um, some of the performance things that I've talked about today are not actually released on there yet. So if you are going to use it, just ping us and let us know, because A, we'd love to know, and B, we're happy to answer your questions, and C, it'll motivate us to actually make sure we push all the uh, latest code updates onto that repository. So that's how you can get in touch with us uh, on Twitter, or you can uh, come to the website. We're hello at tanktop.tv as well. Um, and check out the movie site as well. We'd love to know what you think. We just recently released it publicly. So um, we've gone from an invitation code situation to being publicly available. So we'd love to know what you think. In the movie business, as they say, for this presentation, that is a wrap. Unless you have any questions. But I hope you do have some questions. Have some questions. <laughs> Hi, guys. Any questions? Uh, you know how you deal with the rating of the movies? How do you deal with the problem when someone just presses one vote and it's already av an average of, let's say, maximum because they basically voted for the movie once, but it's like 10 out of 10. So it, sh it should be literally, saying by your formula, be up at the top because of this rating. Yeah, so we do see that quite a lot. So we, we're using quite a lot of different factors in the movie ordering but particularly for a film that hasn't been on Rotten Tomatoes for very long it might have you know five user ratings and it's got 100% um, what we typically find is that, that that changes quite quickly and we primarily are listing films that are available on demand so that's usually four months after the cinema release so there's usually been enough time for the votes to kind of settle down um, that said, some films, and in particular documentaries and kind of art house movies that don't have a huge audience, will quite often, and they're kind of worthy in some way, they quite often get a higher rating. And one of the things we, we now score on is we sort of look at the, the category of a, a film, or we look at how people's sort of preferences, you know, if they actually go and watch these films, then great, you know. The, it's got a really high rating, but nobody actually goes to watch it, then we kind of need to compensate for that. So we look at that on a category basis and pretty much we say, okay, documentaries rate typically higher, so we just kind of weight the scoring appropriately for documentaries, but we just kind of automatically look at that across categories, if that makes sense. Any more questions? Right, thank you, Liz Rice. Let's okay. give them a round of applause, guys. Thank you.